and welcome to another Top Doctors online interview with one of our leading experts. Today, we're very privileged to be joined by Mr. Indipal Birdie, a renowned consultant heart surgeon, and we're going to discuss keyhole heart surgery today. Welcome, Mr. Birdie, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, tell us about your background and your areas of expertise? Sophie, thank you for inviting me. Um, I am actually a consultant heart surgeon. I've worked in the NHS for over 35 years. I now consult, consult at the Keyhole Heart Clinic in London. I actually always wanted to be an astrophysicist, but I realized very quickly that that wasn't really helping anybody. And I think that the greatest value that I get from my work is helping people. And I think that explains really why I moved into my super specialist discipline of keyhole heart surgery, something we're going to talk about at length today. Uh, and that was really recognizing that traditional heart surgery still is fantastic. We get brilliant results from traditional heart surgery, but I just recognized that the specialty was moving into different areas, perhaps even as far back as 25 years ago. And so for the last 20 years, we've been finding alternative ways to perform heart surgery in patients without breaking their breastbone. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're delighted to have you with us. And as I say, we're going to get right into the topic of today's video, which is keyhole heart surgery. So our first question is, how exactly is it performed? So if you, there's two types of keyhole heart surgery, it's really important to distinguish the two. There's the type of keyhole heart surgery where we perform treatments using wires placed in the groin or in the wrist. These are treatments to put stents into heart arteries for people who have angina, or even now to replace heart valves like the aortic valve using a, a treatment called TAVI or a clip called MitraClip to clip the mitral valve. I'm not going to talk about those treatments. I'm going to talk about keyhole heart surgery in the context of how we as surgeons can perform traditional heart surgery, the type of heart surgery that's normally performed through the breastbone, but without breaking the breastbone. The types of treatments we can perform here are uh, bypassing blocks in heart arteries, using bypass grafts. We can change the aortic valve. We can repair or replace it. We can repair or replace the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve. We can take tumors out of the heart. We can even perform heart rhythm disturbance operations like atrial fibrillation, ablation, using keyhole techniques where we sneak to the heart between the ribs rather than breaking the breastbone. And this, we believe, allows patients, when carefully selected, to just recover so much better with less pain, less infection, less bleeding, just overall so much better in those patients who are suitable for it. Okay, so that's interesting to hear. It has a lot of applications, many, many applications. Indeed, absolutely. Far Fantastic. more than people actually realise, both yeah. actually patients as well as clinicians. A lot of clinicians still don't realise what we are able to achieve as keyhole heart surgeons in the modern era. Fantastic. So how long does it take to perform um, a key a keyhole heart surgery procedure, does it take longer or less time than sort of traditional open procedures? You know, it's interesting you say that. I think we found, we've been doing it for 20 years. So we found that generally on the whole, doing keyhole heart surgery doesn't add a great deal of extra time to the overall surgery. We prefer not to use robotics. And the reason we prefer not to use robotics is because robotic heart surgery can add considerable time to the procedure. We found that using two-dimensional or three-dimensional video assistance with long shafted instruments that look like chopsticks, to be honest <laughs> with you. These are ways in which we can actually ensure that the keyhole heart surgery is as short as it can possibly be. I think on average, it would be fair to say that a keyhole heart procedure might take 35 to 40 minutes longer than a traditional breastbone procedure. And of course, it's, it's more technically orientated. It requires a very experienced surgical and anesthetic and perfusion team to perform. But the, the pain of the procedure is almost trans third to the individuals delivering the procedure in order to try and relieve the patient of some of the disadvantages of having their breast bone broken. Okay, so it sounds as though it has a lot of benefits. I'm sure a lot of people who might have to undergo this type of surgery are wondering, is everybody suitable for it? Or are there some people who are not good candidates? Well, traditionally, we've usually performed keyhole heart surgery for one problem. So for example, if you've got a mitral valve problem, then if it's in isolation, you may be suitable for keyhole heart surgery. If you've got an isolated aortic valve problem, you may be suitable for keyhole heart surgery. Sometimes we are now performing double keyhole heart surgery, where if you've got a patient who's got an aortic valve and a mitral valve 
problem in our hands in the right patients we can sometimes perform double procedures but generally on the whole if you've got a single problem we should look to see where the keyhole is possible the other thing that we like to do to assess patient suitability is to perform a ct scan it's a really important test this test looks at the health of a big pipe in the body called the aorta now this is a pipe that starts from the heart goes upwards and then downwards, like arches downwards and splits down the legs, sends blood to the arms and sends blood to the brain. What we want to know is that the inside of this pipe is healthy and is not furred up because in order to perform keyhole heart surgery, we would make a tiny little cut in the groin to put micropipes in the groin to go onto something called the heart lung machine. Everybody needs a heart lung machine if we're gonna open the heart to perform heart valve procedures. And in order to do it through keyhole, we're not able to put big pipes into the heart directly because we don't have the space. Through a small cut to operate on the mitral valve, a little cut about a centimeter and a half underneath the nipple or in a lady underneath the breast, you'll never get these pipes in there. So we do a CT scan to check that we can put the micropipes in the groin. We put the pipes into an artery in the vein. We can go on the heart lung machine that will support the heart whilst we do the things that we need to do on the TV screen using our chopsticks. So that's the most important test. There are other things. We sometimes come across patients who are just too unwell for traditional heart surgery. And sometimes we would look at some of the other treatments that we talked about earlier on, like treatments through wires in the groin where we know that the results from those wires in the groin keyhole treatments are not as good as keyhole surgery, but those patients are not suitable for uh, a more complicated procedure. So generally on the whole, two simple tests, how fit is the patient and a CT scan. And those two things can tell us if a patient is suitable for keyhole. We find that perhaps 80 to 90% of people who come to see us at the keyhole heart clinic are suitable for keyhole heart surgery. So it's really worth talking to your local doctors or your cardiologists or your surgeon about their experience in this area, because I think there is real value in the right patients. Interestingly, there was a, a very interesting publication that, that came out in November of last year from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, NICE, most people call it NICE. And they have now recognized that patients who need aortic valve surgery or mitral valve surgery if they are either suitable for keyhole heart surgery or they express a preference for keyhole heart surgery, they should actually be referred to a center of expertise if local expertise does not exist. And I think that that's the, the first real sign that the evidence base is gathering for the benefits of keyhole heart surgery when deliver, delivered by experienced teams. So really worth exploring this issue. Okay, thank you for explaining that so clearly. Um, so it's clearly got a lot of benefits for the right patient. If a patient is preparing to have this uh, type of surgery, is there anything they can do beforehand in their day-to-day -day life or anything in general before surgery that they can do to prepare? There are some simple things that, that, that patients can do. Uh, well, let's not talk about the medical issues, you know, things like uh, a few days before the surgery may stop blood thinners. Those are things that we as doctors will sort out for the patients. But in terms of getting themselves ready, Clearly, with COVID being like it's been over the last two, two and a bit years, you know, keeping healthy, staying away from people who've got coughs and colds is quite useful. We do have a policy still of isolation prior to admission. We are performing COVID screening on patients prior to admission. And indeed, we perform COVID screening in the private sector on relatives as well to ensure that we can keep patients safe and healthy. And I think we've succeeded very well uh, uh, in the private sector in, in that endeavour. In, in, in order to just keep muscles active, we recommend that patients should exercise. Now, when I say exercise, when you've got a heart problem, you can't really exercise in the full capacity, but walking each day is really important because it will just keep you motivated and keep the mindset in the right place. We like to ask patients to prepare their skin to reduce the uh, bacterial flora on their skin prior to heart surgery, and we can guide that. And there are a few other tips and tricks, you know, preparing your family, for heart surgery, making sure that they're engaged with the conversations that you've had with the heart surgeon. And we're always really, really keen on family members being involved in that conversation. And, you know, it, it's, it's something that, that patients have uh, not, that really struggled with during COVID because family members have sometimes not been able to see 
uh, their relatives in hospital. And when they phone them, patients sound so much iller on the telephone than they do face to face. So I always say, get your leads ready, get your iPhone ready or your iPad ready so you can bring it into the hospital with you. So you can literally FaceTime with your relatives when you're in hospital. And those simple things will really aid your recovery. Trying to lose weight before heart surgery is sometimes really quite difficult because often people with heart disease just haven't got the capacity to lose weight easily. But reducing your smoking, if you smoke, reducing your sugar intake and eating a, a more rounded, healthier diet is always going to be helpful for you postoperatively. It keeps your bowels uh, active. And of course, one of the things that we sometimes find in patients who need heart surgery or any kind of surgery is that they get constipated because they're starved for 12 hours prior to their surgery. They don't eat anything, eat anything for another 12 hours. And so keeping a high fiber diet, perhaps even bringing some prunes or prune juice into hospital with you is really helpful, far better than the medicines that we give you to clear your bowels. These simple things are the ones that I find most valuable for patients. Some really useful information and tips and tricks that I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't have thought of before. So thank you for that, Mr. Birdie. Unfortunately, I have to ask you about risks and complications because we know that with any surgical procedure, they carry some kind of risk. So what are the risks and associations associated with keyhole surgery and, and are they high risks? So there's two things to say about keyhole heart surgery. Firstly, we've recognized that experience really matters. And I don't just mean the surgeon, I mean the surgeon, the anesthetist, the scrub nurse, the perfusion team, they're all really important. And we find that, and the data demonstrates this, that experienced teams lead to outcomes far similar or perhaps superior to, 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 to traditional heart surgery. The second thing to say is that it's all about the pre-assessment. And we talked about some of those pre-assessments. We talked about the CT scan and how important that is in assessing patients' aorta pipes, that pipe in the body that we assessed for micropipes in the groin. But remember that CT scan also tells us quite a lot about the kidneys, about the lungs, about the liver, about the bowels, about the rest of the body. So we really get a great idea of how healthy a patient is before we offer them keyhole heart surgery. So we may find that there's a bit of a bias there because in our experience, when patients are suitable, we see at least as good outcomes, if not better. For example, we don't see that there's a higher risk that you might die from keyhole heart surgery. We don't see that there's a higher risk that you might get a stroke from keyhole heart surgery if patients are properly assessed. But what we do see is a significantly reduced risk of bleeding, infection, and pain. And of course, keyhole heart surgery, when it's performed between the ribs to repair the mitral valve or to repair or replace the aortic valve or to do bypass grafts, if we do them between the ribs, those incisions, those little tiny incisions heal in seven or eight days, not 12 weeks. So we find patients can get back to their activities so much quicker. One of the things that we do see with the breastbone is a slightly higher risk of infection. If we get infection here, it can get into the bone. With these keyhole incisions, we don't see bone infection at all. Now there is one specific risk that we do recognize with keyhole heart surgery. And that is a risk that your surgeon will tell you about when he's assessed or she's assessed you for suitability. And that is the risk of conversion to the breastbone. Now, what on earth does that mean? What it means is that any time during the keyhole heart surgery, we as surgeons want the ability to go back to the breastbone if there's anything that we're concerned about, or if there's something we recognize that isn't going to allow us to perform the perfect procedure through the keyhole. Now, this latter point is rarely the issue, but sometimes we face issues with the surgery where the exposure is not as good as we may have anticipated, and we will then go to the breastbone. And in that setting, we've already ascertained within our minds what the real consequence would be for the patients. And what we generally find is the consequence is minimal because these incisions really don't cause too much trouble with pain or issues. So, we revert back to the breastbone, we just go back to the normal operation that we would have performed. Of course, it's disappointing for patients, but I always say in the rare occasion that happens, we shouldn't be disappointed because we're still gonna get a perfect result. Now that risk is usually about one to 2%, so it's not high. So that's really what we're talking about. Pretty safe operating in experienced hands. Fantastic, I'm sure that offers a lot of reassurance for people. <clears throat> who are expecting to undergo this type of procedure, who are worried about possible risks and complications. 
<clears throat> so following um, keyhole surgery in the heart, moving on to recovery now, what exactly does the recovery process entail? What should patients expect? Well, you know, I think here we do need to manage expectations a little bit because remember, keyhole heart surgery of the type that I've described, not the catheter-based or the wire-based treatments, they are the best way to treat heart conditions generally on the whole. So if you are suitable for keyhole heart surgery to repair or replace the aortic valve, it's better in many ways than some of these wire-based treatments. If you need a mitral valve repair, again, keyhole, if you're suitable, is better than the wire-based treatments. But it needs us to use the heart-lung machine. And that means we have to stop the heart generally on the whole. So patients still have had a major operation, but they'll get a very good result, both in the short term and the long term. So whilst they will heal so much quicker and their recovery will be so much quicker compared to a patient who had their breastbone broken, you'll still feel tired. You'll still feel like you had an operation. You might feel a little bit sad after the surgery. People do feel sad after heart surgery, partly because of what we've done to you, partly because of the drugs, and partly because of the fear that a lot of patients have felt, but perhaps don't always manifest it, obviously, about their own potential mortality, the fact that they've developed a major heart condition that required a major heart operation. So generally on the whole, what I say to patients is, look, you're gonna recover quicker, you're gonna get less pain, you're gonna get less risk of bleeding and infection, but you're gonna feel tired. By the first week, you'll be walking a mile a day. By the second week, maybe one or two miles a day. By the third or fourth week, you should be walking up and down hills generally and feeling very comfortable literally from day one and moving your arms around so you can keep that flexibility. With the breastbone, it's a little bit more inconvenient, you see, because for the first six weeks, you can only lie on your back when you go to bed and you have to put pillows behind your shoulders so the breastbone isn't under strain. If you lie on your side, the breastbone can grind and we that might impair healing. After six weeks, you can perhaps get back to driving with the breastbone, but you still can't do any heavy lifting for a further six weeks. So I really see the benefit of keyhole heart surgery when I see patients in my clinic at three or four weeks, they are a totally different group of patients to those that have had their breastbones broken. They're really in, in a much further point of recovery than the breastbone patients. Okay. Um, <clears throat> actually, that's all of our questions for today, Mr. Birdie. I want to thank you in particular for explaining your expertise in such a way that people can understand it at home. And I'm sure you've offered a lot of reassurance for people who are expecting to undergo keyhole heart surgery or who have a loved one who is uh, who is uh, expecting to undergo this type of procedure. So many thanks for joining us. And um, I would like to remind anybody watching, if you have a heart health concern, if you are looking for <clears throat> any form of treatment in this area and you wish to schedule a consultation with Mr. Birdie, please don't hesitate to head over to www.doctors.co.uk where you can learn a bit more about Mr. Birdie and schedule a consultation with him. And thank you again, Mr. Birdie. It's been fantastic. Oh, pleasure. Take Thanks care. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.